everybody. Today, the best bad idea you will ever have. This is the Maserati Gran Turismo, and I'm sure you've already heard and seen that there is now a new, a very long overdue second generation. So that seemed like the perfect opportunity to come back and revisit this, the last of the first generation cars. And in this video, we're going to be discussing what made the car so flawed, so special, and whether today it is still worth your money. So turn the volume up and enjoy. Today's video inspires you to head to the classifieds in search for a Maserati. Please don't forget to use Car Vertical, the super powered super search that cross references a number of databases to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase, including usage as a taxi which would be brave, but not impossible. Outstanding finance, which is far more likely. Mileage issues and the big one, accident damage, which was something like this you really want to know about. To get all that information takes just 60 seconds and all you need is a registration or a VIN number. And don't forget, for 10% off the service, use my discount code. On with the video. This is one of those cars that I think you'd forgive anybody for buying, regardless of how good or bad it actually was. You cannot deny this thing is a rolling sculpture, an automotive piece of art and a musical instrument all in one. However, it is also, I think, fair to say that by the time this, the final iteration of the Gran Turismo came around in 2017, it was also a car that had somewhat overstayed its welcome, having been introduced a decade earlier in 2007 and only technically ending in 2019. Though in practice, I'm not sure many cars, if any, were actually built that year because at least one article I found from 2018 says that by then you couldn't actually order one anymore. Cars in this category, sporty GTs, being on sale for a long time isn't exactly unusual. Just look at the likes of the Aston Martin Vantage, the DB9, the Jaguar XK, the Bentley Continental GT. All of those had a very long shelf life. However, what makes this quite so extraordinary is that it was born under very, very trying circumstances. The story goes, though how true it is, I don't know, that Maserati were working on a new car to replace the aging Grand Sport, which itself could trace its roots back to the 3200 of the late 1990s. But along the way, they found that the car was becoming quite expensive, and so it was decided it would sell a lot better if it had a Ferrari badge on the front. And as at the time, Ferrari were technically in control of their modernese rivals, there wasn't really anything that Maserati could do to stop it. And if the rumours are to be believed, the car that came from this was the Ferrari California. And this left Maserati in a fairly difficult position because they had no genuine sports car. So they decided to play one of the oldest tricks in the book and take a saloon, in their case the Quattroporte, stick a sexy body on top and essentially call it a day. This allowed them to bring this car from idea to execution in a record-breaking time, just nine months. And it certainly would have helped that in the Quattroporte, Maserati already had one of the sportiest four-door saloons around, complete with glorious, naturally aspirated Ferrari-built V8 up the front. It is also for this reason that the car gained something of a USP. Only really along with the Bentley Continental GT, this is a car that can claim to be a genuine four-seater coupe. The likes of the 911, the XK, the DB9, those really have only token rear seats. But these, you can actually get an adult in. Perhaps not for all that long and maybe not the tallest of them, but they will fit in there, making this a very practical car. The boot wasn't the largest, but then again, neither is it in a DB9. This, I would say, is fractionally larger, making it a very, very dailyable car. 
Suspension is double wishbone, front and rear with aluminium arms. You have drive sent exclusively to the back via a six-speed gearbox. And much like the Quattroporte on which it was based, the Gran Turismo had a couple of them. One being the MC shift, essentially a derivative of the Ferrari F1 box, so a single clutch automated manual. The car also then gained the same six-speed ZF Auto as you saw in the later Quattroporte Automatica. I will soon be doing a buyer's guide on the Gran Turismo, but in short, over time it evolved. You had the introduction of the 4.7 litre Gran Turismo S joining the 4.2 litre base car. Then the hardcore two-seater lightweight MC Stradale with a little bit more power and a rortier exhaust if such a thing were possible and believe me it was. This was later replaced by a four-seater version of the MC Stradale. Then you saw the Gran Turismo Sport trying to tidy up the model line. Things evolved and then we got to 2017 by which time the car was already old and a few major changes were made. So, the MC Stradale was dropped entirely, as was the base 4.2, though I'm not actually sure anybody had been buying it for about the decade previous. As soon as the Gran Turismo S arrived, that was the one that everybody wanted. The model line was boiled down to two options, the Gran Turismo Sport and the Gran Turismo MC. The Sport was the entry-level model at £93,000, and the MC, the slightly more hardcore model, essentially taking over from the old Stradale. That started at £108,000. Confusingly, the base Sport got the Skyhook adaptive dampers, but the MC did not, instead having fixed-rate items presumably Bill Stein's because that was Maserati's brand of choice. It also got styling cues inspired by the MC Stradale including this very sexy bonnet with the big scoop in it and the nice little cutouts at the back. That's made of carbon. You have a more aggressive front end, an extra gill on the side of the car and at the back a Stradale-like arrangement for the exhaust. For that reason these cars are often mistaken for being MC Stradales and apparently on the V5 this is actually written down as an MC MC Stradale, but it is not an MC Stradale, it is an MC. The other big change, and I think of most significance for people, was a slightly new interior, and I do mean slightly. Overall, it's still the same as it ever was, featuring a whole host of these small little round buttons in confusing and unusual places. This ancient HVAC, which felt out of date 10 years earlier, but surrounded by acres of gorgeous leather, Alcantara and other materials, and this was joined, most crucially, by a new infotainment system, again replacing one which already fell out of date a decade earlier. This was lifted essentially straight from the Levante of the time and introduced Apple CarPlay and Android Auto amongst other functionality. It's for that reason that this car's owner Michael deliberately sought out a later Gran Turismo. He previously had a Toyota Supra and though he really loved that car he fancied something a little bit more exotic. He didn't want to hop on the Ferrari train and for the money you pay to get one of these, 70 odd thousand pounds these days, you could get into a 360 and F430 but those are cars which are older, going to come with old Ferrari problems, or you could get into a California, which is also an old car now, will come with old Ferrari problems and also the image issues associated with a California. In other words, non-Ferrari people will hate you for buying a Ferrari, and Ferrari people will hate you for buying a California, which is a shame, because I think it's a great car. If you're still confused and unsure how to tell the difference between this and a legitimate MC Stradale, because it is difficult to tell, the bumpers will give it away. But honestly, the easiest way to spot one of these is the gearbox. The later MC has the ZF Auto, which comes with this traditional automatic style lever, whereas the MC Stradale has buttons instead. For myself, the MC Stradale would be the car that I'd lust after, but there is still an awful lot to be said for one of these. First off, it possesses all the qualities of essentially every Gran Turismo, namely drop-dead gorgeous looks which I think here are perhaps at their absolute best and that incredible soundtrack, of which I think we should sample a little bit right now. I'm going to put the car into sport mode which opens the valves permanently, manual for the gearbox which you can operate via these huge paddles behind the wheel just like in my old Quattroporte Sport GTS, drop it down a few gears and let's go.
you really do play this car like a musical instrument. All of this I am doing well within the speed limit. Lovely. We're in uh, fourth gear now. Let's have third. Ooh. Let's have second. Oh no, we've slowed down a bit. Let's speed up again. The engine in these is a close relative of that in the Ferrari F430, part of the F136 family. However, here it has a cross-plane crank rather than a flat plane, hence the massive difference in the quality of the sound. The fact is, though many would consider the Ferrari to be the more exotic noise, this has been scientifically proven to be better. It is allegedly an actual aphrodisiac. Don't believe me? Ask Jason Kimissa. Even in its early life, the Maserati did struggle to present good value for money. Particularly when compared with the likes of the Jaguar XKR, this never gave you quite as many ponies for your pounds as you'd get with its rivals. But at all times it responded by having oodles of charm. Not just in terms of that fabulous soundtrack, but also the response. The fact that it really, really does want to be revved. Here, that red line is at 7,500 RPM, about the highest I think it ever got. Though peak torque of 384 pound-foot, that's 520 newton meters, doesn't sound all that bad. More tellingly is the fact that it arrives at 4,750 RPM, which is likely about 3,000 RPM higher than whatever turbocharged thing you've been driving lately. Stuff like that BMW M2 that just went past. Have you seen the new M2? Ooh. The six-speed gearbox was also somewhat old hat by 2017, and the fact is it drives pretty much the same as my old Quattroporte, which is from 2010. Of course, around town, as a regular slushy-matic, it does a pretty good job, and in its defence, when you are on the move, it does respond nicely, and if you want to use manual mode, as I am now, it's actually not that bad. There's your downshift. There's another one. That's pretty good. In sport mode in particular, it's nice. Upshifts. They're reasonably quickly action. That one was at lower RPM. Let's give it a bit more throttle and I'll show you what it can do. Okay, here we go. And... Yeah, it's never quick. It doesn't snap like the MC Race Shift does. And that was one reason I did quite like that gearbox. When you were on it, it really rewarded. It's essentially the same gearbox as you'd find in a 430 Scooter rear or a 599 GTO. Wild thing that it is and a real part of the Stradale's charm. This is just one of the things you'd have to be willing to live with if you want to buy a Gran Turismo. What else would you have to live with? Well, fuel economy, that's never great. On the journey down here, Michael achieved 28.5 to the gallon, which I think for a 4.7 litre, 460 horsepower, naturally aspirated V8, dragging a car that's not very light, near 1.9 tonnes, was actually pretty darn good. However, if you want to have fun, that will drop very quickly, and his worst thus far was not 28, but 8. The car also, though entertaining in these sections, just isn't all that keen compared to just about any other proper sports car. The steering is hydraulic, but the rack is quite slow, and though it does have a little bit of feel, feedback and texture, sometimes not quite as much as you would like. It's certainly a better steer than the Quattroporte. You also sit quite a bit lower, it feels just that much better. These seats also vastly superior to those in the QP, but that's only because those are the worst seats fitted to a sporty car ever. They have absolutely no side bolstering. They're useless. It's rude, this thing. I tell you what is frustrating is it did just seem to upshift for me. I didn't ask for it, it just did it. Yeah, did it again there. Naughty Maserati, naughty, naughty. The suspension in this MC is also not quite right. This is something Maserati nearly constantly struggle with. It's just a little bit too firm and jittery at just about all times. The Skyhook adaptive dampers in the sport car then meanwhile apparently are a bit too soft and wallowy. As I haven't driven one of those, I couldn't confirm or deny for myself. But I would say this is just, yeah, a bit too harsh for British roads. And the big frustration for me really is that this is a car which, though you can have some fun in it, just isn't the keenest in the bends. So it feels like that overly stiff suspension is just unnecessary. There's no reward for it. 
Other things you have to watch out for, well, as it's still a big car, parking it can be a pain. You do have a reversing camera and parking sensors, front and rear, which help. This is my fabled three-point turn hill start torture test, and the car does pretty well, but it can be tricky in tight spots. And there is one thing you do have to worry about with this car. That's because it has such a massive wheelbase, you are always worried about beaching it. This little section here, I'm just waiting for the scrape. One day it will happen. That engine up front has been pushed back as far as it can go. It feels like the first three feet of the bonnet are there for decorative purposes only, and I think they might be. But one of the downsides of it being as far back and low down as it will go is that this car doesn't have anywhere near as much clearance over things like speed humps and the like that you would expect. And you would have hoped that this being a very mature platform by the time it was built, this would at least mean it was reliable and dependable. In the time that Michael has had this car, which isn't, all that long. It has been mechanically totally sound. It's on just under 20,000 miles and it's a five-year-old car. You would ruddy hope so, wouldn't you? But the electronic side of things hasn't been quite so good. When he picked the car up, the boot lock had already failed and he knew about that and it did get sorted. The car has an extended Maserati warranty on it, courtesy of its previous owner. He didn't get it from a Maserati dealer, but as it has the factory warranty, it goes back to one to get all the work done. The washer for one of the headlights, that failed twice. And one day, the infotainment system just totally shut down and when it eventually rebooted, it was all in Italian. Servicing on these is very expensive. If you do need parts and you do have to pay for them yourself, they are also very expensive. Even compared to Ferrari prices, they're expensive. And certainly, compared to Porsche or Jaguar prices, they're really bad. This particular example is also very rattly. I'm gonna talk to Michael about this when I'm done because I haven't experienced this before. There's some sort of rattle coming from the dash and possibly the steering column. And when I was leaving the car park today, some of the suspension was creaking too. I know these have a particular appetite for ball joints, so it is possible that one of those or maybe a bushing isn't quite as good as it should be. The brake pedal also has a kind of worrying inch of travel where it doesn't really seem to do much and then becomes a little bit too responsive. That's frustrating and really, again, should be something they sorted years before. However, and I know this is typical Italian car cliche territory, this is a vehicle that remains far more than the sum of its parts. It is Italian, therefore it is a car you know is probably going to give you grief every now and again. And so for me, the really important thing is whether it's good enough for you to forgive it. And to me, a Gran Turismo always has been. And here in its late MC iteration, I'm kind of struggling to think of reasons beyond the infotainment why you should seek out one of these specifically but that doesn't detract from the fact that the rest of the package is still rather marvellous. Gorgeous looking outside, gorgeous inside, plenty of luxurious materials and little touches that do make it feel like a very, very special place. Love the little clock up here. I'm not sure it's quite as nice as the one in the old Quattroporto. And okay, little bits like the screen up here are so, so hilariously out of date, but it is just a car that oozes oozes from every pore, charm and character. You can daily drive it. Michael does daily drive it. He only does about 600 miles a month. So he said, you know what? Yeah, it'll drink more fuel than the Supra did, but sod it, it's a Maserati. You don't get anywhere near as much grief with one of these as you would with a Ferrari. People generally love them. And now we have a second generation on the way. Hopefully that's gonna rekindle interest in the earlier car, because honestly, I think it deserves it. This was something that I remember every time I read a review in any magazine or watched anything on YouTube, people would say, yeah, I really love it, but go and buy something else. But you know what? No, don't go and buy something else. There'll always be a 911 out there. There'll always be a boring alternative. Don't do the boring thing, buy one of these. The new one looks great. It does look absolutely gorgeous, as it should. It's essentially a slight reworking of this, fundamentally. But mechanically, though maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, I don't know. You've got a V6 engine option, you've got a hot V6 engine option, and then you've got the electric option, which is very interesting. I'm kind of impressed at Maserati for doing that. But to me, a big part of the character of this car is the engine, and that turbo V6, I've experienced it in other cars. It's effective, it's quicker for sure, but it's just, it's just not gonna excite like this does. 
I think people are going to be going very gooey for these in the next few years. And the simple fact was that, yeah, sure, the car was out of date, particularly in the last sort of three, four years. This was a model that I think never was supposed to exist. It essentially kept it going while they were working on the new one. And the rumour was that they had another idea for a car, the Alfieri that Ferrari nicked and became the Roma. But that, well, I don't know. You make your mind up. However, this car being out of date, this car not being the latest, greatest here, there, other, and generally awful in terms of top trumps, none of that, not a single bit of it, stops me from wanting to buy one. And tell me you get bored of that. A huge thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. Bye-bye.